During these days of the Easter octave, we're hearing from all the various Gospels the stories of uh, the resurrection of Jesus when he first appears to the, to, the, to the women by the tomb, when he appears to Mary Magdalene, he appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then also as he appears there to the, uh, to the eleven, to the apostles. The, uh, um, one of the appearances of Jesus that, that we don't have in the Gospels that we believe must have happened is the appearance of Jesus to his Blessed Mother. Uh, Saint Ignatius, in, the, in, the, um, in contemplating the resurrection, which happens during what he calls the fourth week of his spiritual exercises. You know, the spiritual exercises, uh, um, as he has them written in his uh, great work on the spiritual exercises, is divided up into four weeks. And so the, the, uh, the fourth week is dedicated to the praying about, reflecting on, contemplating the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And St. Ignatius, in the very first meditation on the resurrection, says that even though it's not in Scripture, we can, in, in faith and in, and in, and in uh, devotion, um, imagine that Jesus must have appeared to his mother first. And, uh, um, and so he invites us to, to pray about that, to think about that, to reflect on that. Um, it's been something that has been fasc has fascinated me since I ever first time I ever heard about that. Um, first, I heard from, read about that in the spiritual exercises because uh, I never had considered that before. Um, Saint John Paul II, in a, in a in an audience, a general audience, back in uh, 1997. Um, reflected on that, and I wanted to uh, to, to kind of share with you a little bit of, of his reflections. He, he, the very first words that he spoke at that general audience was this, he said, after Jesus had been laid in the tomb, Mary alone remains to keep alive the flame of faith, preparing to receive the joyful and astonishing announcement of the resurrection. That, you know, the disciples, we heard in the gospel today, is the disciples, the apostles were there, they were mourning and weeping. And Mary also was in mourning and weeping because of the death of her son. She stood beneath the cross. She shared in his sacrificial death. Her heart accompanied him in the tomb. And yet, in her faith, she, we believe, she trusted in what he had told her and his disciples. That yes, he would die, but yes, he would rise again. And that in a way, she alone kept alive that faith. That she, who was the first one to believe in him, she who was the one who loved him the most, she who, of all people, knew him best, knew that he was going to rise again. That didn't that that helped to assuage only a little bit the pain and suffering that she went through as she saw her son rejected and and scourged. She saw her son carry his cross and be brutally nailed to the cross. She, of all people throughout all time, uh, walked that way of the cross with him with the greatest of love. And so in the silence of Holy Saturday, she, with her faith never wavering, despite that pain and suffering, waited on that, that moment of the resurrection so the, the saints and the, the scholars through the, through the centuries have, have prayed about that and thought about that. St. John Paul II says it's, a, it's not surprising that it's not mentioned in the Gospels because what's, um, 
what's mentioned in the Gospels is what's necessary for, for our salvation. What's necessary for us for understanding the good news about Jesus Christ. That He was God made God in the flesh. That He was the one that, that brought salvation to all peoples. That uh, the, the, the good news about what He did and what He taught brings us to a whole new life. And so this uh, appearance to Mary wasn't necessary for the gospel, but it's something that we can pray about and reflect on in faith and in devotion. And so uh, um, he says that, St. John Paul II says that, uh, that the, the, the silence attributed to the gospels on this appearance um, says that it wasn't necessary for our saving knowledge entrusted to the word of those chosen by God as witnesses. That the apostles were the ones that were called to give that testimony to the, to the Lord's resurrection as we, as we hear them doing in the, in the Acts of the Apostles today. But then the St. John Paul II says, uh, Before appearing to them, the risen one had appeared to several, several faithful women because they were uh, to tell the, the, the apostles the, the good news. It says, if the authors of the New Testament do not speak of the mother's encounter with her risen son, this could perhaps be attributed to the fact that such a witness would have been considered too biased by those who denied the Lord's resurrection. We know that, uh, that not all the appearances, remember, Jesus was with the apostles for 40 days before he ascends into heaven. And, uh, and so we contemplate that, that truth, you know, during these, this time between Easter and the ascension of the Lord. And he says that the Gospels only give us, a, uh, John Paul II says the Gospels only give us a few of those appearances and not a complete summary of what happened. Remember St. Paul in, uh, in 1 Corinthians tells us about Jesus appearing to 500 of the brethren at one time. And yet that's not recorded in any, any of the Gospels. So we can, in our prayer and in our devotion, imagine that encounter between Jesus and his mother. Jesus walks into that place where she was in prayer. And uh, Mary, with great joy, says, is it you, my, my beloved son? And falls down upon her knees to worship her Lord, who is also her son. We can imagine Jesus with the greatest of love because he knew the suffering that his mother has gone through. And he also knows her great love for him and her faith and trust in him. One of the, one of the saints of our church imagines that Jesus kneeling down there with her and wrapping her in his embrace with unspeakable love. And in that, that, that moment of embrace that, that her heart overflowed with joy. Her heart rejoiced. She who from the first moment that that angel had appeared to her had received God's word and God's truth. She who from that first moment of the angel's greeting had, had pondered and contemplated what God wanted from, from her, what God was asking of her. And she knew in this embrace and in this encounter that Jesus was asking her to, to carry this faith of hers, this love that she had for him, carry that with her to be that 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 heart of the church there as the church awaited that first Pentecost and as the church goes out to proclaim the good news that she would be that, that model of the church in love with Jesus full of faith full of trust and so we call upon Mary to, to help us in these days of this pandemic and these days of, uh, of Easter to have that same love of Jesus and that same faith and trust in Him. We're in the midst of these uh, 
these, these eight days of Easter, and we look forward to celebrating Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, we're going to celebrate that, that, that great and most awesome gift of the, 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 the Divine Mercy of God that, that, that gives us our salvation, that, that, that gives us that victory over sin and death, that victory over darkness and sadness and mourning. So we look forward to this celebration. We're going to have a holy hour um, on Sunday from 3 to 4. And we'll celebrate. We ask that uh, we might celebrate this divine mercy with that same type of love that Mary had, that same type of faith, that same type of trust that she has in Jesus. <laughs>